industrial coating. Um, so the main reasons behind uh, automating a paint boot uh, really are uh, labor shortage, the work quality, uh, or it could be productivity or the worker safety. So we're going to be addressing all those different subjects today. And uh, my, my topics are going to be uh, the currently available technologies, their capacities and limits, uh, and how to evaluate your needs. My guests, Pierre, Hi. what, what will, you, will be your uh, subjects today? Well, we'll be, uh, first of all, introducing our company, Evotech Industrial Coating. Uh, we'll talk about manufacturing process, uh, different paints requirements, and the uh, market trends. Okay, so stay tuned till the end. Uh, since it's our uh, first uh, time in, uh, in English, uh, we will be uh, making a, having a draw of a participation price at the end. So make sure you stay uh, with us in, until the end. And uh, while we set up for my part, uh, we will be showing you a, a quick information video on uh, how you can uh, ask questions throughout the webinar. Thank you. All right, so let's start with the available technologies at JSA Machinery. First of all, uh, we do have the, the, the flow coating uh, technology. So uh, it could be either uh, horizontal or vertical. Uh, these are addressed for, uh, it's, it's a specialty for wood treatment. Uh, you could be working with uh, furnitures, uh, windows, doors, or any wood structures. Uh, so it's uh, basically, uh, flow coating is uh, uh, a treatment shower uh, of the product that you're going to put on the on your wood surface. Uh, it's a very minimal technology where there's no parameters uh, such as uh, thickness of uh, product or uh, the amount of product that you're, you're going to be putting on your uh, material. It's really uh, you're just passing your parts through uh, a shower. So uh, I'm not going to address too much of this technology today as we want to cut to the more of the robot lines, but just know that it's technologies that we have available for you. Uh, the, uh, the main difference between uh, horizontal and uh, vertical is that when you're looking at a vertical system, it's a system that's going to be able to be uh, automated. So we're going to be able to put those parts on a chain uh, of production where uh, if you're looking at uh, a more of a sorry a more of a horizontal system uh, you're you're going to be uh, looking at more uh, more of a, um, a manual uh, entry manual exit of your of your parts so no uh, no really no automation solutions there uh, other than just the, the the part is being painted by itself as it's uh, being trained in, into uh, the machine. Uh, the second solution that exists, would, uh, we would call the Cartesian robot. So it, it is not yet what we see as a robot, uh, like the arm uh, moving around. Uh, it really is more of a robot that's uh, built on a Z axis. So making some movement from up, up and down. Uh, uh, so we have a nozzle of uh, paint this time not as the uh, flow coating where it's a more of a, a product that you're going to be using for wood. This is uh, more addressed for painting. Uh, but again, it's, it's not as accurate as either a, new, a human or a six axis robot. 
So uh, these technologies would be used more for uh, primer coating of uh, doors or primer coating of uh, any wood structures if you're thinking about uh, prefab walls and things like that. Uh, again, not going to go so much deeper uh, into, uh, into that. Uh, what you see on the picture on the screen right now, uh, you're seeing uh, some jams being uh, receiving a, a primer coat. Uh, so you can see on the left of the screen, uh, you, you see the nozzle there. Uh, it's really making a movement uh, from up and down. Uh, no parameters, again, on uh, the quantity of uh, paint that's being used. Uh, it doesn't really matter if there's uh, little drops or, or things like that. So it's not a very precise work, but it can be, again, automated uh, as a, a, chain, a chain of production. So it's really uh, gaining time there uh, in your production. Uh, now, let's cut to the uh, anthropomorphic robots. Uh, much easier to say six axis robots. So I'm going to use the six axis uh, for the rest of it. Uh, and uh, it, so, so six axis robots is really what you're thinking of when you're thinking about an, an industrial robot. So it's really the, the arm that moves around and, and recreates uh, the human work. Uh, very flexible and agile. Uh, and what we, we're going to be looking at is really uh, at a level of uh, re repetition of, of, your, of your work, a very uniform work. And you're, what you're going to see day one is what you're going to see uh, five years down the line. It's always going to be the same quality that you're going to be uh, driving out of your uh, robot. Uh, again, now the most important part of uh, the technology is not the robot itself. It really is all driven by the software uh, behind the, the robot. And this is where uh, the company we distribute, uh, Finiture, has put all uh, their effort at creating the best software out there uh, to uh, help you with your, your work. So what I'm gonna do to explain the best I can is uh, take you on a journey of a part throughout uh, uh, the layout. So first thing first, uh, if you're looking at the left end of the screen, you're gonna be a place, you're gonna be looking at this, uh, a charge and uh, so load and unload part. Uh, this is where your, uh, your, your employee is gonna be sitting. Uh, he's gonna be loading the parts there on the machine and uh, using a uh, barcode reader, he's going to read a barcode to uh, tell the machine exactly what to do. Part is then going to make his, uh, his way through a, a scanner. Uh, here's a picture of a scanner. So the scanner is working with two different technologies. It's working with infrared system, and it's also working with laser system. Sorry. Just going to explain to you exactly how this works. Uh, so the um, infrared system is going to be giving you the length of the part and its position in space. So what I mean by position in space, if the part would be hooked this way on on the the hooks, the machine would know it would tell the robot to where where to go and where to paint where the laser are going to be taking parts if, it's the, if the part is crooked this way or this way. So it's really the, the combination of the laser and the infrared are going to give you uh, a, like a 3D modeling of, uh, of the part that's being painted. So if I'm going back to the first uh, stage, you're, you're, you're going to be scanning a barcode. The barcode is only going to be given the, the information of what product is being uh, is being painted. So let's, uh, if we're talking with the window industry, uh, let's say I have a four and a half frame uh, and I want it black. So this is going to be the information that's going to be on, on the, the barcode uh, itself. There's not going to be any length, uh, any size of the window that's going to be involved in it. It's really going to be uh, just uh, the, the a matter of uh, giving the color and giving the, 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 the robot the, uh, what he has to do, what program he has to do. So the next part, if I'm going back to the layout there, 
uh, so there's a, where you see on the bottom of the screen and just about in the middle, you're gonna see uh, what we call like a buffer zone. So this buffer zone, uh, parts have been uh, scanned, the information is entered uh, for size-wise in the machine, but it's kind of uh, just a buffer zone where, uh, for example, if, you're, if your regular shift has a, a break uh, in the morning uh, of about half an hour, well, if you're loading that buffer zone, the, the line is gonna keep on going while your employees are uh, taking their break. So it, it's, it, again, it's a, it's a good idea to have one. It's not mandatory. Uh, the, the, the layouts could be drawn any different ways, but just, uh, it's just for the example, we did put one that had one. Uh, so again, just a buffer zone, nothing is happening there except parts uh, resting. Uh, then the next part, uh, the, the part is gonna enter the painting boot itself. Uh, so uh, as you can see on the, on the layout, uh, the part is going to enter in front of the robot. At this point, as soon as the part enters, the robot starts his work. Uh, so the robot is going to be controlling the speed of the part that goes uh, in front of him. So what I mean by that is that the part is not going to be stopping in front of the robot. If it can keep on moving to avoid losing time, it's going to keep on moving. But the robot has the power of stopping the part if he, if he feels like he needs to. So let's say we have a, a huge window to be uh, painted. Uh, we're we're going to be, uh, the robot is going to tell the, the line to stop. The good thing about uh, how Finiture designed their their line is that uh, the, there's a, a two rail system uh, on, on the, the, the machine. So it kind of, uh, if, you, if you do uh, skiing, uh, if you're thinking about the chairlift getting at the bottom of the, the hill, slowing down for someone to sit down, and then you're looking at the rest of the, the, the chairlifts, they're, they're moving at the same rate. It's because it's a dual speed, a dual uh, rail system so the robot is using the same uh, technology to slow down the part in front of him and the rest of the line just keeps going at the same pace so you're not losing any time there uh, next part is going to be uh, the drying area uh, are you working with ambient air are you working with uh, oven are you working with infrared all technologies that are available they're uh, I don't believe there's any uh, good or bad solutions there. It really depends on the product you're painting and uh, the paint you're using and how fast you want the parts to be out of the system and things like that. So it, it's all topics that could be addressed, but just know that all the technologies are available to put in there. It's just a common uh, paint boot, such as all the other ones at this point. Um, the, I wanna bring your attention to the top just middle of uh, the the screen now, uh, you're gonna be you're gonna see that the parts are kind of shifting sideways. So again, we're using a, a double rail, but this time instead of uh, changing speed, it's just the parts that are moving sideways. So you can see that the buffer zone, the uh, the resting area, can can uh, have a lot more parts than if they were just one behind the other and uh, staying on the on a single uh, rail there. So again, not a huge technology, but it's something that you're, uh, you're really uh, gaining a lot of space in your factory. Uh, I've said it before, those layouts can be adapted to all of your needs. Uh, there's, there is not a, a, a one solution, solution fits all. It's really, uh, we're gonna go to your factory, see what you have to do, see how you're doing things, and then draw a layout from there. Uh, this this one is just an example, an easy example of what can be done. Uh, important part, uh, if you are uh, using many different colors, such as pretty much every company is out there, uh, you probably have uh, uh, black is, is your biggest color, but in, once in a while you have to paint uh, some windows uh, green or pink for any reason. 
uh, know that the robot uh, has a, a solution of cleaning itself uh, in between every single rack that comes in uh, the, the, the uh, paint zone. So even though you would be painting black all day, the nozzle would be clean in, uh, after every uh, racks or of windows that comes in front of it. So make sure that we don't have any uh, dust or anything that builds up on the, on, on the end of the nozzle and, and, and have uh, some bad work to be done on, on it. So just a short video on, of uh, how it's done. Uh, you're, you're seeing here that the robot is uh, painting, making its way around the, uh, around the window and then going to be clean as the, what you don't see there is that the parts are actually moving out of the, of, of the paint boot and the next windows are coming in at the same time. So you're, it's really uh, working in the downtime. It's not working, uh, it, it's not adding any time, any manuf manufacturing time to your process. Uh, the, another thing is uh, pump stations. Uh, so you can see on this picture here uh, many different pumps. Uh, usually what we try to do with uh, customers is uh, address the biggest cell, uh, sales uh, colors. So again, if I'm thinking about uh, Canada, you're probably going to have uh, one pump that's going to be black, maybe one pump that's going to be commercial brown, and then uh, you're going to be looking at uh, a custom color pump. Uh, what we try to do is have uh, two different pumps uh, for that, that would be the custom colors. So you're not rushing uh, to be changing your color every single time there's a new color. If you have two of them, you can switch in between them. Uh, and you, you're going to have uh, a last pump that's going to be uh, the, the, the water pump where it, it just uh, helps you drain uh, the color as you're switching colors. Uh, Keep in mind, again, if you want 20 pumps for 20 different colors, it's, it's, it's just a matter of uh, knowing it when we start the project on uh, how many pumps do you want. Uh, it, there's no uh, right or wrong answers uh, towards that. But with the only thing with pumps that we're gonna be telling you is we're gonna be telling you uh, what kind of, well, what size of pumps that you should uh, buy. But again, we're not, uh, pump sell uh, sellers, uh, you, you work with the company you're used to work with. Uh, we're just gonna be addressing the size of them uh, to make sure that the robot doesn't uh, uh, miss paint during uh, the, the work. Um, all right, so uh, Capacity and limits. Uh, the first of all, the, 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 the one big subject that we have with customers is uh, can this be working with uh, solvent paint or water-based? So my answer is the only difference is gonna be the price. Uh, if you're gonna be working with solvent uh, paint, uh, you're gonna have to have the system to be explosion proof. So you're gonna be adding somewhere around $100,000 for the system to be uh, explosion proof. Other than that, uh, this whole debate about uh, solvent or water uh, based, you're gonna have with Pierre or your uh, paint provider, uh, it doesn't really change anything uh, at, the, at the level of the robot. Uh, very important uh, details that uh, needs to be addressed uh, when we're building the, a quote for you is the temperature. So is it hot, is it cold, is it humid, or is it dry in your factory? And obviously in Canada, one day is hot, one day is cold. Uh, we have uh, all those different temperatures. So uh, there's such things as uh, air conditioning or uh, machines that are gonna play with uh, the humidity level in your, in your factory, especially in the paint booth itself. Uh, those are things that we're gonna be addressing with you. Uh, to make sure that we uh, give the, the paint all the chances it, it can have to be drying at the, the good pace that's indicated by the, the paint company. Um, I, I talked about uh, racks uh, before. Uh, you can see on, the, on the, this picture right now, you, you see the racks uh, 
those racks could be two meters, 2.5 meters, three meters, 3.5 and four meters wide. There is no uh, limits of how many parts you can put on one rack. The best example I can give you would be uh, you're painting one window that's one frame and two sashes. Uh, obviously, it's going to be the same color, so you're going to be able uh, to fit all three parts on the same rack. The only thing that you're going to be uh, looking at is make sure that you have enough space in between, in between all parts for the robot to be able to do his work uh, if you're kind of painting on the side of it so make sure that you over, overflow the hall, all the contour of, uh, of your window. Um, then next is the capacity of the robots. Uh, there, there is uh, three available robots that we work with. The first one would be the small one. It's a uh, three meter by 2.8 meter. Um, we haven't sold any systems with that because windows are tempting to be bigger and bigger right now. Uh, if you're uh, looking into a much larger capacity, uh, there's another robot that has a, a capacity of uh, four meters by 2.5 meter or we can change with the same robot having 3.4 by 3 meters uh, capacity. If, uh, if ever you think that this is not enough, uh, just know that uh, the robot can al always be installed on a seventh uh, axis. Uh, as you can see on the picture here, uh, this, this exact project was done in uh, Europe. Uh, it's 20 meters long rail. So there is really no limits to the size you can have for that uh, seventh axis. So this was done for a company that builds uh, pre-built uh, walls, just uh, to give you an example of uh, what can be done. All right, now, uh, most important part, uh, how to uh, evaluate your needs. Uh, biggest questions I get every single time uh, I'm going to a customer that wants to automate uh, his pain boot is, can I add a robot in my existing room? The answer is not that easy. I'm not going to say no, but I'm not going to say yes. So here are the things you need to address if you want to keep your existing boot. So first of all, the part needs to be capable of moving. So it needs to, if you, if we're going back to the layout there, it's going through a scanner that measures the part. So if your painting boot does not have a chain, it doesn't make any sense for the way our uh, system works. Uh, second thing, uh, that scanner, uh, again, it needs room. So if, uh, if your paint boot has uh, a chain, but there is no room to install the scanner, Again, we're gonna be facing a problem because this part needs to be measured in the scanner. Um, a third thing would be, uh, if I'm going back again to uh, the layout, uh, monorail. So if you're, most of the chains that exist right now on the market are uh, on a, a monorail system. So first of all, you're not gonna be able to do the dual speed like I talked about in front of the robot. So let's say you're stopping your part in front of the robot it, it, and uh, the, the rest of the line is gonna be stopped. And uh, the second thing is uh, the resting area where you're not moving, uh, you're not shifting uh, windows sideways to accumulate them, then you're gonna be facing a problem in, uh, in space. But again, that's not uh, no or no go for the robot itself. Is just to keep in mind that the robot is not going to be optimized if we're always slowing down the, the chain. Uh, the part must be stable, as stable as possible. Uh, so a good system uh, of uh, hooks would be needed to be in place. Simon, la pièce. So if I'm going through the scanner this way, and as I'm moving the part shifts this way, well, it's not gonna be painted because the robot waits for it this way. So you need a system that's gonna be holding the part throughout the whole system the same way you've put it on. Uh, after that, maximum sizes. Uh, 
uh, just keep in mind that the robot needs 600 millimeters uh, on, the, uh, on the ground below the part to be able to do, the, to do his work eventually. Uh, eventually. So uh, most of the rails I, systems I've seen are much lower. So the parts are, are really uh, moving like very close to the ground and it's usually the painter that uh, bends his knees and goes under it. Well, the robot doesn't have any knees, so it's not gonna be able to go there uh, for you. Uh, and keep in mind that you have the rack, you have the rail system, uh, and your biggest window, so it, it gives you quite uh, an important uh, height uh, to be respected. Uh, last part would be uh, security. Uh, it is not a collaborate, collaborating robot, so it needs to be caged. Uh, there is no employees that can be next to the robot while it's moving. Otherwise, it's not going to be there. There's a security uh, fences that uh, that will stop the robot. So uh, what I've seen on uh, paint boots is that there is not enough space to ha add the robot, but not enough space to add the security around it. So it, it again, it's uh, something that stops it, uh, stops the projects there to uh, modify an existing room. Um, now the creation of a new boot or modification of a previous uh, or, or modification of one if all previous points uh, were respected uh, the information that we really need from you guys uh, is uh, one uh, the maximum size of parts that you want to paint this is going to give us the rack size this is going to be giving us the size of the boot itself that we're going to be creating uh, and it's gonna give us a lot of information uh, on how to uh, first uh, start the drawing of uh, the boot itself. Uh, the second thing would be uh, a 3D plan and uh, pictures of the surrounding. Why am I asking it a 3D plan? Is because we're building a building into your building, okay? That's a lot of building, uh, but we need, to, uh, we need to know what's above the ground and not only work with the 2D uh, to dimension uh, drawing because we we need to know like how much height do we have in, in, in all of the surrounding uh, why pictures is uh, many times I've seen uh, plans from a factory that were missing a post that were missing a window on the wall and things like that that could be something very bad when we're installing and not realizing that we had an, something in our way there uh, something we don't want to uh, happen again. Um, third thing that you need to know, uh, need to give us is uh, how many parts do we have to paint uh, in our shift? It's going to be addressing how many racks we have on the line, uh, obviously the size of the paint booth itself. Uh, another thing is the parts drawing. Are we uh, are we painting uh, window frames? Are we painting doors? Are we painting chairs, for instance? Uh, so we need to know what we're painting. So obviously at the beginning to have all of the drawings uh, really help with the, 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 the planning of the, the layout that we're gonna be doing. And uh, how many colors? Uh, we've addressed that for the number of pumps and trying to know as much as possible of uh, the use of those colors. Because uh, many times people are coming to us saying, hey, I have 45 different colors, but really we're only using two at 90% of the time. And the, all the 43 others are uh, just once in a while. So it, it's gonna change the pattern of uh, how we're designing your line. Um, just keep in mind, uh, those projects can be done in two phases uh, where we could be, first of all, building the paint boot itself and on the second phase, adding the robot, uh, that would be uh, a way to be splitting the cost uh, just about half and half. So uh, this is gonna be done for, for me. Uh, if you have any questions uh, that came in, uh, okay. so um, we, don't, we don't have any questions, all right. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna be leaving you guys with uh, a quick time-lapse of uh, the last installation we did of uh, a paint boot uh, while Pierre is uh, setting up and uh, for his presentation.
Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Martin and uh, GSC Machinery for inviting us today for this webinar and have the opportunity of meeting all of you today. So let's first of all talk about the uh, table of content. Table of content, we uh, will be introducing Evotech and then uh, we'll, uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we'll be talking about the manufacturing process as well as the uh, paint requirements, which I split my topic in two AMA standards, as well as uh, surface preparation requirements for different substrates. Then we'll, uh, we'll be followed by uh, trends and a question period. Brief history about uh, Evotech. Evotech was founded in 1965. Uh, it was the former division of uh, uh, Seco Industrial Paint. And uh, it, uh, uh, first of all, got involved into the manufacturing of paint for residential door and window market 25 years ago. Uh, for, uh, then they produce, we started to produce two types of systems, a water-based system and a solvent-based system. The water-based system is at 35 degree glass and uh, the solvent-based system is at 45 degree glass. To support uh, the, uh, the, the, that market, uh, we have an R&D department that will analyze uh, our uh, systems, uh, analyze customer needs, as well as uh, define uh, new products and define uh, um, quality control guidelines uh, to make sure that uh, the products that we have um, are meeting the uh, uh, different criteria. Our manufacturing process, are, uh, are uh, uh, being done at the Cornwall plant. And uh, this uh, obviously is uh, a 60,000 square foot plant, which where we manufacture solvent based as well as water based system uh, for all uh, our customer needs. And the manufacturing process uh, starts with uh, uh, raw material picking and weighting. Then we go to the dispersion phase, which is followed then by a sand mill or grinding process, uh, followed by finishing and packaging. In the raw material uh, 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 division, uh, we uh, are handling two types of raw material, powder form as well as liquid forms. When we mix those two uh, products, uh, we create, generate a paste, which is uh, then uh, being uh, processed at the dispersion uh, uh, area. On this slide, you can see different dispersal that we have in, uh, in our manufacturing plant. Uh, disperser we utilize uh, varies from uh, the size of the vessel that we uh, uh, utilize for mixing our paste. So we have uh, a mixing vessel that uh, have a capacity of 60 gallon to 600 gallons per batch. Uh, on this slide, for instance, uh, we're showing the um, uh, 600 gallon uh, disperser that we're using. After having the, uh, the paste dispersed, it goes to the sand mill area. Uh, the sand mill, uh, per se, on this slide, you could see is like a column. And that, in that column, we have like uh, grinding medias where we uh, pump, force form, pump uh, the uh, uh, paste from the bottom to the top so that by doing that, we can generate the uh, homogeneous paste, homogeneous uh, uh, color in terms of pigment as well as making sure that the pigment size is properly grind so that it won't block any spray equipment. When the uh, uh, grind size is uh, finally obtained, QC, uh, we go to the finishing area where we're adding up the uh, rest of the raw material to adjust the viscosity, adjust the color, and making sure that uh, it meets the customer cri uh, criteria. 
without the quality control department, this won't be uh, possible to be done. On this slide, on the left side, you will see that uh, this is a piece of equipment that we're using to analyze the grind, but we're using different uh, pieces of equipment to uh, characterize the product so that uh, it meets uh, customer needs. One, obviously, uh, test that we're doing is color verification, and we're using the LED system. So the, uh, for those of you that don't know too much about LED system, it's a universal system that we utilize to uh, numerically characterize the color. Uh, on this uh, uh, slide, uh, you see that this, uh, the L axis uh, will uh, define the darkness or lightness of the color and the A and B uh, coordinates will define the color, whether it be green, uh, red, blue, or magenta. Then when we have the color numerically uh, uh, in our system, we could uh, uh, compare it to a standard. Uh, in a lot of uh, documentation that you will see, that we're talking about delta E uh, measurements, in our case, we're using a little cousin of the Delta E uh, characterization, which is called the ECMC, because the ECMC is more appropriate to uh, define the color because that is closer to the, what the human eyes can see. Uh, and in our laboratory, uh, we accept a color variation of 0.5 on the ECMC. In uh, a lot of literature, specifically with the uh, AME, for instance, uh, you will read that uh, certain tests requires that the DE uh, should not be more than five in terms of color variation. I wanted to show you on this uh, slide what is a, the, the, what does it correspond for the E of five in a, the same shape, obviously, of the green. You could see here the difference of the, the, the delta E of five for a green. Then uh, we also test heat buildup. What is heat buildup? Basically, it's a uh, way of measuring or predicting how your uh, PVC extrusion will react to uh, sun exposure. Uh, the heat buildup uh, test is based on ASTM D4803 and it compares basically uh, the uh, reaction of your uh, PVC extrusion uh, with the, the, your paint compared to a black control sample. So basically the apparatus that you have here is a open box with isolated styrofoam. On the floor uh, of that box, you have a temperature probe where you're gonna be placing your PVC uh, sample and that PVC sample will be uh, submitted to an IR lamp that you have on the top. And normally the test is done under a 30 minute exposure of the IR lamp. You will be measuring the temperature at that time and uh, then we will compare it to a different uh, uh, standards. So on the next slide, the, uh, the delta T that you obtain from the ambient temperature and the exposure after 30 minutes has been uh, computed in the uh, equation, the 11.2 equation that you see on that slide. And basically, uh, if you were to use the black control sample at that time, you will end up having a, a measurement of 41 degrees Celsius for a vertical uh, exposure and 50 degrees Celsius for a uh, horizontal exposure. In our case, uh, the control, uh, quality control maximum temperature that we're ex uh, accepting is 32 degrees Celsius. So basically, what the, the, does that mean? That means that if you were to, uh, uh, for instance, utilize a product uh, or a, uh, a paint, paint your, your uh, PVC uh, uh, extrusion, and you have a delta T that uh, is, let's say, for, give you a 40 degrees Celsius, and you're at a 30 degree Celsius uh, ambient temperature, that means that uh, your PVC ex extrusion needs to, uh, to uh, withstand 70 degree Celsius exposure. So we know that in our trade, for instance, uh, 
most of uh, uh, the PVC that are on the market right now uh, will uh, be uh, able to withstand temperature around 60, 65. So the, the next uh, uh, slide I wanted to show you is uh, an example of uh, heat buildup measurement that we could get uh, if we compare a white PVC at the top of the table on an horizontal position, you, you're going to get 24.9 degrees Celsius. Whereby if you go, go at, on a black, which is at the bottom of the, that table, you will end up at uh, 25.7 degrees Celsius. We do that for all the colors as well as all the bases that will be used uh, to uh, make uh, any shades of colors. Then when all the tests are being done, it goes to packaging, the packaging area, and uh, ready to be shipped to the, uh, the customers. On top of that, uh, next slide, please. Um, the, um, the, the, as we said earlier, uh, the customers are asking for a lot of just-in-time uh, uh, custom colors. So by, by using our service center and the uh, colorimetry system uh, using a spectrophotometer, uh, we could uh, generate uh, just-in-time uh, custom colors. Uh, spectrophotometer, for those of you that are not familiar with that, are the equipment that we're using to measure the, uh, the, the, the colors. And you've got a um, representation of that uh, spectrophotometer on the front, uh, on the center of that slide. Paint requirements. Well, I mean, again, as I said, I uh, uh, split the topics in two. Well, first of all, talk about uh, AME standards. So uh, we have uh, AME standards have been split uh, by substrate. So we have standards for PVC, fiberglass, and aluminum. They're most uh, likely look alike each other, except obviously the, the substrate differs. So we'll be talking today just on the 26.0 series because uh, it will be uh, almost the same for uh, all the substrate. So what I did is uh, I prepared a table to uh, show you the differences in terms of uh, requirements depending on uh, uh, if you're looking at 2603, 04, or 05 uh, standards. For surface prep requirements, you could see here on this slide that uh, uh, the AME standards are a little bit, uh, uh, I'd say, not so precise for 2603, whereby 2604 and 2605 are requesting proper amount of chromate uh, to be deposited on the substrate prior to the application of the paint. Then uh, if we look at paint film requirements, it varies from uh, a minimum of 20 microns to 30 microns, depending on the standards that you're looking for. And uh, if you look at also the film hardness, uh, strangely, the uh, different standards uh, uh, are uh, asking for a harder film, which is an H minimum for 2603 against uh, 2604 and 2605, which are requiring a F minimum, which is uh, uh, Smooth, uh, softer hardness uh, of film than uh, the 2603. On adhesion requirements, um, mainly uh, all three standards are almost alike. They're asking for no failure on dry and wet adhesion as well as, uh, as impact resistance. Uh, it differs a bit on 2604 and 2605 for uh, boiling water and uh, abrasion resistant, uh, which are a little bit more stringent uh, requirement for 04 and 05 uh, for AME. Next slide. Uh, chemical requirements. Um, again, uh, all three standards are asking for the same thing for resistance against muriatic acid or mortar resistance. Uh, and it varies a bit for nitric acid because in this case, uh, only 2604 and 05 are requesting uh, resistance to nitric acid with a delta E of maximum five of after 30 minutes of exposure. Next. Humidity and uh, salt spray resistant. Uh, this is probably where 
uh, we could see the differences between 2603, 04, and 05. Uh, in these cases, uh, the uh, resistance or the uh, uh, tests uh, require uh, 1500 hours to 4000 hour exposure, depending on uh, uh, the, the standard that you're looking for, whether it be under uh, the humidity chamber or the salt spray, resist uh, salt spray uh, uh, cabinets. On the weathering, there's only uh, uh, an accelerated test exposure for 2603. And where it really differs is the outdoor exposure where uh, a one-year exposure South Florida is requested for 2603. And uh, 04 and 05 are respectively at the five years and 10 years with a maximum DE of five again. And also some requirements in terms of, uh, uh, I would say, glass retention. Then the next requirements are surface preparation. We're dealing with uh, uh, six different uh, substrate uh, when we're uh, in the residential uh, market. PVC, polypropylene, pre-painted steel, pre-painted aluminum, bare aluminum, and fiberglass. So let's talk about the different uh, surface prep requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we first of all have to uh, uh, deal with PVC. So a simple cleanup with acetone is required. Uh, that uh, is uh, required to remove any deleterious substances as well as lower the surface tension of uh, the PVC so that the, the paint is uh, wetting properly uh, the substrate. Polypropylene, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, we have to first of all clean up the surface with acetone, then use an adhesion promoter like our 360-051 with a very fine mist coat, uh, then let it flash off before application of the top coat. For pre-painted steel or any pre-painted uh, metal surface, uh, I've put a warning on this slide because it's very, very important that, uh, first of all, you have to check out the compatibility of the, the pre-paint coat against the, the top coat prior to do any big work because uh, there are some uh, pre-painted coating that are not compatible with your top coat. So the process when you've checked that then is to clean up the surface, scuff the surface, and make sure that you don't remove all the pre-paint coat from the surface. Otherwise, you're going to have to reprime the surface prior to the application of the top coat. After uh, scuffing, obviously, clean again and top coat. On pre-painted aluminum, same uh, uh, remarks that I did before. Make sure that you have a good com compatibility of your pre-paint coat against the top coat. Uh, clean up the surface, scuff the surface, make sure again that you don't remove all the uh, pre-paint coating before the application of your top coat, and then top coat the surface. On bare aluminum, the, it's a little bit more complex. You have to first of all sand the surface and clean that surface before the application of a vinyl wash primer, uh, such as our 360s or uh, 535. And uh, you have to apply a mist coat of that product, allow it to, uh, to dry a bit, but the application of the top coat should be done between five minutes to four hours after the application of vin the vinyl wash primer. Otherwise, you're going to have to start again the process uh, to uh, prepare your surface. Fiberglass, uh, very easy. You've got to clean the surface, cut the surface, Make sure that you remove also any type of uh, water repellent that could have been applied by the uh, uh, manufacturer, especially the ones that are shipping products from abroad because these products are being utilized to avoid having uh, any uh, fiberglass warping. So you have to remove that before top coating the, the surface. As mentioned earlier, we have like two systems, Icretane Aqua Series 528, which is our water-based system and Acritane 3000 Series 592, which is our uh, solvent-based system. Both systems have excellent adhesion to PVC, fiberglass, pre-painted steel or aluminum, and uh, they come in 29 standard Gentec color. Uh, we have also a system for staining 
and uh, Acrotane Aqua, both systems have a low heat buildup uh, uh, characteristic and they have a proven track record of uh, 20 years. About manufacturing trends, uh, there are uh, trends for manufacturing and trends for final customer. These are two different uh, uh, ways of looking at trends. On the manufacturing side, obviously, the most important thing is to improve productivity. If we think uh, or talk about uh, uh, paint installation, obviously, you, we have three steps, surface preparation, paint application, and, and lint drying. So surface preparation, there are many ways to automatize uh, the, uh, uh, I would say, uh, mechanical uh, adhesion, which is uh, scuffing or, uh, or sanding. Although the minute that you have to talk about uh, solvent application, it's done manually because the system that uh, would, need, uh, would be needed to do that would require explosion proof requirement I and mean, it's too costly for the, the trend we are right now. Paint application, thank again, uh, I, I'm not uh, gonna talk too much about that because Martin had already done a good job on that. On the end lid side, uh, there are very various ways to do it from air frost dry to IR uh, drying, which will improve productivity. Then on the customer trends, uh, we have to talk about colors. Uh, Martin had already start to talk about that in Canada. Uh, black is very popular, but we have also some uh, trends on wood appearance where people are trying to do or give wood appearance on fiberglass as well as on PVC. Then finally, uh, I'm just going to give you the uh, most popular color that we see right now in the market, which are black, iron ore, commercial brown, slate, pebbles, or chestnut brown. So this is finalizing my presentation, and I uh, thank you again for your time. And if there is any question, uh, I'm open to answer your, all of your questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much everyone for joining. Uh, thank you very much, Pierre, uh, okay. to uh, taking part of this. Uh, they, this was a kind of a, a first experience for us. So uh, Pierre was diving into the unknown with us. Uh, thank, thank you very much uh, for your participation. Uh, like I said in the, the beginning, since it's our first experience, we decided to uh, go with a little price. So we uh, got you guys, uh, one of you guys, some uh, ear earplugs. Um, Pierre, will you do the honors? Well, taking one name down there. Oops, that's way too much. That's mad. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Sebastian Young from Coltec. Congratulations. We'll be uh, reaching out to you uh, for your price and uh, shipping it to you. Uh, I believe I have uh, two questions that came in, so uh, we're going to address those uh, before uh, ending this. The first question is from Mike. Uh, what's the estimated capital cost for a concrete system? Uh, so uh, for a complete system, if you're, uh, Mike, I'm not sure if you're in Canada or USA right now, uh, but if I'm talking in uh, Canadian dollars, you're going to be around somewhere uh, $700,000 uh for a complete line if you're uh splitting that in the half like i mentioned before you could do uh, the paint boot itself and the robot uh it's going to be just around uh that level of price uh obviously depending on the project uh, we could uh, state that you need two robots for some reason or things like that well it obviously would uh, change the price but you're you're going to be in in that area for pricing 
the second second question is from Mercedes. Uh, can we paint wood? Yes, it's uh, it's feasible. Yes, of course. There's only a uh, wood primer then to utilize uh, to be utilized prior to the application of, of the paint, but there is no problem to paint wood. All right, so uh, that ends it for question and for our our webinar. I would like to invite you to uh, our next webinar is going to be uh, October 14th. And uh, my guest is going to be Mathieu Hébert. Uh, he's going to be uh, with us uh, to talk about uh, hardware trends, uh, codes, and things like that. On my part, I will be talking about uh, the automation of, uh, of a, of a pass-through line. Uh, pre-drilling of, uh, of hardware and uh, going through that subject uh, for you guys. So October 14th, 11 a.m. same time uh, is going to be uh, our next appointment. We will be reaching out to you guys uh, in the next uh, few days to see if you have any questions on uh, today's uh, webinar uh, for my part and uh, Pierre where I will also be able to uh, address all questions uh, coming for paint. Uh, once again, Thank you very much. Thank you.